And good morning. Welcome to Cadsville Parish Church on this second Sunday of Advent. I'm delighted to talk to you today about a part of Advent that we don't think about too often. Of course, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, but Advent is also about anticipating the second coming of Jesus. So I'm going to be looking at some scriptures today that will help us get a picture of what that might be like and how we might prepare ourselves to anticipate that great day. I'm delighted this morning to have the Topping family to help me with the service and to light the Advent candle. So, Kenny and Leslie. Good morning. Today's Advent readings are from the second book of Peter, chapter 3, reading from verses 8 to 13, with the second reading being from Mark, chapter 1, reading from verses 1 through to 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly. Live as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. The second reading is Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey, and this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. O oh God, you are always doing a new thing, even now. Bring us to the day of our salvation. As we light this candle today, we ask that you turn our eyes to the heavens and our hearts to you, our great King, Holy One and Saviour. Amen.
And will you pray with me? Father, in the bleak midwinter, in the darkness and in the cold, we pray that you would shine your light to give us knowledge and understanding that we might see the way but that we also might be warmed with comfort and the reassurance of knowing your presence and your purpose and your plan. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As an American living here in Britain, I have followed the events that have transpired in America over the last month with peculiar interest. And one of the most interesting things to me is the rise of what they call the QAnon movement. Now, this is a curious thing, and really what it is, it's a tangled web of conspiracies, all kinds of different things, and Trump has alluded to, on more than one occasion, uh, the deep state, which is what he believes is a shadow organization that is attempting to undermine his presidency. Whether there's any truth to that, I don't know, uh, but it's one of those things that lots of people have thought about and th thought, yeah, there must be something going on. But one of the many conspiracies in the QAnon movement is that there is a cabal, a, a deep state or a secret group of elite people who are actually running the world and governing things as they see fit, which includes the pandemic, which includes the transition of power from one president to the next, which covers over the issues surrounding the vote and many, many other things, including the belief that there's actually a secret race of lizard people who are controlling the events of our lives. And they even advocate that the royal family is actually a member of that secret lizard people. Now, the more I hear about QAnon and other uh, conspiracy theorists like that, the more I think, well, it's a good thing that people listen to that stuff and think, well, that's, all, that's a bunch of nonsense. But the fact of the matter is, in fact, the worrying fact of the matter is that many, many thousands of, of Americans, hundreds of thousands of Americans, including some who have recently been elected to national office, are firm advocates that the QAnon movement is legitimate and that their duty in life is to rise up and to defend America from this conspiracy of these secret race of lizard people. Believe it or not, religious leaders fall into the same trap, and they have throughout time. Long before QAnon arrived on the scene, religious leaders wanted to know something very particular, and it was a sort of the same thing, only they described it in these terms, that they wanted to be able to predict the end of the world, Armageddon. And throughout history, there's hundreds of examples of people who have said a date, right? On May the 13th or on September the, the, the 28th, the world is going to come to an end. And all the prophecies of the Old Testament, the ones referenced in the New Testament about the coming of the Lord with fire and with the, the moon turning to, to blood and, and, the, and the sun going dark, that's going to happen. And they gather people around them, all expecting that imminent moment when the Lord would return and the world as we know it would come to an end. And they've all been wrong. Because here we are still. Here we are still and we're still anticipating that day. Now what is it about those kinds of movements what is it about QAnon that, that, that tweaks people's interest, that keeps them looking for some sort of answer? Well, I believe that knowing these things or believing that you know these things puts you in an elite crowd. It puts you in amongst those people who know, who know beyond those who are controlling things, who know beyond the elite who are controlling the government. They, they know something that's even beyond the lizard people. There's simply a desire to know and to be part of that very inner circle that's controlling the events of the day. But if all the people who should have been in that elite circle and wasn't, by his own admission, was the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus prophesied the end of the world. He said that the day of the, the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But no one knows. No one knows the day or the hour. Not the angels not the Son, but only the Father. Nobody knows when it's coming. It might come this afternoon, or it might, well, by the time you see this on video, it may have happened already. 
But it may be some time after that. We don't know if it's tomorrow or we don't know if it's a thousand years from now. But we do know, because it's been promised by the Lord Jesus Christ, that it is coming. That his second coming. And this is that that other part of Advent that's so important that we understand. Of course, we all know the story of Christmas with the coming of Jesus in, in the Virgin Mary and Joseph and the trip to Bethlehem to be counted for the census. But that's only one half of the story. That's the first bit. If you can imagine two bookends of history, one on the left and one on the right, the birth of Jesus is the one on the left, the beginning. But the second coming of Jesus is the one on the right. Now, if you take away either one of those bookends, then the books collapse and time loses its meaning, but they're held together, one on one end and one on the other. And so, just as important as it is for us to know about the birth of Jesus, it's also important that we think about the second coming of Jesus, because Peter has some very plain words about what that means and how we should live in consequence of the fact that there is an end coming, whether it's tomorrow or a thousand years, is irrelevant, so much so, so much as, so long as we know, (laughs) so long as we know that it's coming. Because the way we understand the end ought to affect the way that we live in the now. As Stephen Covey writes in his book, The Seven Habits of Effective People, or Highly Effective People, I think, he says, effective people begin with the end in mind. They begin with the end in mind. In other words, they set a clear picture of what the goal of whatever it is they're working on so that they know then what are the intermediate steps that I need to take to go from this present place to the place that I want to be? Because knowing how it ends affects the way that you live in the interim. And so is the same about the coming of the Lord. That right-hand bookend ought to affect the way that we act and the way that we live today. Now, I was having a conversation with some gents in a church, actually in Texas. I was participating in a Sunday school class via Zoom, which is one of those things from the pandemic that I hope we were able to keep because it was good to meet some of these fellows. And we were having a conversation about Advent. And the question of the second coming was brought up, which then led to a conversation about, well, what does that mean? And more particularly, what do we believe about the second coming? And as we had this conversation, we began to sift through a variety of ideas. And and basically, we came up with three. That people had three different ideas about the second coming. The first, which is the one that's described in Scripture, is what the prophet Joel describes as the great and glorious or the great and terrible day of the Lord, the great and awesome day. Paul describes it in the book of Philippians where he says, uh, when the Lord returns, um, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, this is not going to be an event where people say, did that happen? I'm not really sure if that happened. I don't think that happened. Because when they see the coming of the Lord on the clouds with glory and power, there will be no question but that this is the end of the world, which is why Jesus counseled us there will come prophets in the end. Some will say there's the kingdom there or this is it here, but don't pay any attention to them because in the end, we won't need someone to tell us about the second coming because it'll be obvious to everyone that they will come just as was prophesied, just as Jesus promised the angels said when he ascended into heaven, why are you looking into the sky? He will come again just as he has left you on the clouds in great power. That's one way of thinking about the second coming. The other way, the opposite way of thinking about the second coming is really to basically not think about the second coming at all, but rather to accept the fact that it's already here, that the kingdom is already among us, 
that we have a pretty good life, that we're, we're doing our best to make our way, that God has been with us in the form of Emmanuel, Jesus, our sins are forgiven, we're happy in our church, we have decent lives, and things are actually pretty good. And, and the fact of this, the promise of the second coming really shouldn't impact us at all. It's just one of those things from the Bible that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the present day. Obviously, another way of thinking about it, or rather, a way of not thinking about it. And perhaps that's you. The second way was what one felt, what I might think of as the incremental model. In other words, we're, we're working towards the coming kingdom by making efforts, by, by fighting for justice, by making sure the poor are fed and, and uh, the naked are clothed, etc., which are admonitions directly from Scripture but there was a the belief in this second position that we're actually working our way towards the kingdom. That we're not looking for a dramatic re-entry of Jesus Christ as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Rather, we're working towards that together. We're making progress. Now, I'm not sure where you'd come down on that question, are you one who would look at the scriptures and say, well, Jesus has clearly said he's coming back? Or would you say, as Jesus said himself, that the kingdom of heaven is with us, is among us, within us? Or would you say that we're striving, we're living in such a way that's going to bring the kingdom to, to us, that, that we would hasten the day of its coming by simply learning to live within the ethic of the kingdom of God? Where are you on that question? It's maybe not one that we think about every day and certainly not one that we ponder too deeply very often, but, but during the season of Advent, it's where we pull stuff off the shelf and we have another think about them. We don't really need to be reminded about the Christmas story and the coming of Jesus so much as we need to consider that other half, the other bookend. Because if we fail to contemplate that, then we're lit. We're just living in a loose time in between. In the first century, though, the return of Jesus was a subject of great interest. People expected Jesus to return imminently, a bodily return of Jesus, as was promised in the book of Acts. He's going to come on the clouds with power and glory. People were looking for that. People were looking for the second coming of Jesus. And in fact, Jesus said, some who are living today will not perish before they see the return of the Son of Man. Even Jesus believed that he would be returning within the lifespan of some of the people that he knew and had talked to. And you can see that in the apostles as well, that they were teaching people to live in such a way that don't, don't make too many changes. As Paul says, don't, don't get married or give in marriage. Rather, just if you're single, stay single. If you're married, stay married. Because it really, the most important thing is the imminent coming of the Lord. But as time progressed, the writers uh, began to change and they began to think more uh, long-term. People began to ask questions like, well, what if this person's died? What happens then? And, and Paul had to, to come up with an answer that they, they've gone to sleep and they're, they're, they will be raised on the last day. But Peter was also dealing with the same question. And the, the problem that he was wrestling with was that he had false teachers that had come in amongst the church, people who were teaching things that were contrary to what he taught. And one of those things was the, that people were scoffing about this promise of the second coming. And it was almost as if they were th the same sort of sentiment as w when Jesus was being crucified, that they were taunting him. Why don't you come down from, from there? You said so much about God. Where is God now? And the same sort of attitude was at work in the church. Peter said, in the last days, there will come scoffers who ask that question. Where is this coming that you've promised? Why hasn't the Lord come? Now, the simple asking of that question was unsettling to people because they'd all been taught to believe that the Lord was coming soon and that they needed to be ready and be prepared for that. And they probably spent time each day looking into the heavens and praying to God. But here were these scoffers raising doubts in their minds. And we get the same sort of thing today. 
that people scoff and they think, well, what is this second coming all about? And they may retreat into that belief that, that uh, it's already here or we're working our way towards it imminently rather than embracing something that's more dramatic in the sense of his actual second coming. And Peter had an answer for them. He says, don't, 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 be, don't be distressed because with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And then he said he's, that the Lord is not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. The Lord has a different sense of timing than we do. And that this time that we're living in right now is purposeful. That the Lord has these bookends in mind. He doesn't tell you it's here or here or here. He simply tells you it's, it's at the end. And he's waiting. He's waiting. This period that we live in right now, as I've described before, is a period of grace in which the doors of heaven are opened wide and all are invited to come in through the gate who is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the gate or I am the door and no one comes to the Father but through me. It was a picture of a sheep gate and sheep don't climb in over the walls. They come in through the gate and this, this gate is wide open right now. And the delay, or what we perceive of as the delay in that second coming, is actually a result of the Lord's plan and purpose to keep that door open until as many as he's planned for can come into that gate. So we have this question then about how do we live in the meantime? If I were to tell you you were diagnosed with cancer and say had six months to live, how would that affect the decisions that you made day to day? You'd probably pull out that bucket list and say, oh, I want to do all these things. I want to do paragliding. I want to go to Thailand. I want to do this. I want to see my family, etc. Knowing the end affects the way that we live in the interim. And Peter counsels us. He says I, you should be living in holiness and godliness that you should strive to be found by him without spot or blemish in other words you're to live a particular kind of life a life that says i know that the end is coming and it is my heartfelt desire to be ready to be prepared on that day. This is exactly what John the Baptist said. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, be con confess your sins, and be made clean. In other words, get yourself ready because the day is coming. Might come tomorrow. Might come a thousand years from now. We don't know but we do know that it's coming and that you and I are called to live in a particular way, a way of holiness and humility, a way that says God is the most important thing in all the world. God is more important than my job. God is more important than my family. God is more important than my health. God is more important than the amount of money in the bank. All these things are undergirded by faith in God. All these things are held up by our belief in God. That's the most important thing. And as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of the kingdom, we learn more and more about what that looks like. We become more like Christ. We begin to finish the work that he started in us. And it says in Philippians, that surely he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. We're not working towards the kingdom. We're living as if the kingdom is already here, but we're expecting the fulfillment of that at his second coming. So ask yourself that question. Where, where do you stand on those, those three options? Are you a believer in the physical the bodily return of Jesus Christ do you feel as if the kingdom's already here and that this is as good as it gets and we may as well settle down and make our homes here or are you in the middle are we working towards things and we're going to bring the kingdom in of our own volition our own power 
Because how we think about the end affects every decision that we make until we get to that day. So friends, as we approach the days of Christmas, as we come closer to the celebration of the birth of our Lord, I pray that you will bear in mind that second bookend. That second bookend, it says we're not there yet. That Christ is coming back. And that in the meantime, we are called to live lives of holiness and godliness. And so I admonish you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to live as if he's coming tomorrow. Amen. The time is near, all the crowning of the year. Make your house fair as you are able. Trim the hearth and set the table. People look east and sing today. Love the guest is on the way. Stars keep their watch when you join me in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, you promised in your words that Jesus Christ would come, and come he did, in the form of the infant in the manger, the mystery, the wonder of God with us, Emmanuel, who came to save his people from their sins and to give life in all its abundance. God, how we praise you for that most precious and wonderful gift. There is nothing that compares to that. But Lord, you also promised that Jesus would come again to judge the living and the dead, a Savior who would complete the work of salvation. Oh, what a mystery and a wonder that day will be, a day on which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. On that day all will see, and all will know, and all will bow as the wise men did in humble adoration. But until that day comes, the world remains shaded in darkness. And we see the world and we know the truth, but only in part, only in pieces, only as through a glass darkly. Our minds are too small to behold such things, but the light goes on shining in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. Shine that light in our hearts today, bringing hope and holiness to your children. God, our world is troubled as never before. This pandemic lingers like an unwanted guest, menacing and hostile, and one from which our only defense is to hide and to turn away from neighbor and nature. But you have not given us a spirit of fear, but rather one of courage and perseverance. And so as we await that final day, let us live these days, this day even, in holiness and godliness. Father, we pray for those who suffer during this winter season, for those who have lost work, for those who are fighting for their lives even now, and most especially for those whose loved ones have been forced to die alone. We pray for the doctors and nurses and the many people at the hospitals who are on the front line and whose resources are stretched thin. We pray that you would strengthen them, that you would bless them, and you would make them whole. 
Strengthen us all as we make every, every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with the Lord. On the day of Jesus Christ, He will finish the work begun in your people and will redeem the world forever. And until that day comes, let our lives be as shining light to guide the way so that none might perish, but that all would come to a knowledge of the Savior through repentance. Lord, with you a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. So let this day pass like a thousand, and the next thousand pass like a day, until that day comes. Father, we ask that you hear our prayers and our praises to you, even as we follow the example of Jesus, who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I ask you in the knowledge of his second coming, what kind of lives will you lead? I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to live lives of holiness and godliness, even as we look forward to the day of his coming. And now may God strengthen you with every blessing and every grace to live as he has called you to live. And may God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you. Amen. service and are we having it and when is it and the answer is no we're not having it this this year because of the pandemic for obvious reasons but we still are gathering toys and if you'd like to purchase a gift for a young person or a child we can we're going to be collecting them at the church hall on the 12th of December from 12 o'clock till 3 p.m. so if you'd like to make a donation you can bring it by at that point we're also collecting winter clothing, uh, so go through your closets if you have coats that you're not wearing, gloves, hats, scarves. Um, if you'd like to donate new underwear or new little socks, we'll collect those as well, and then we'll take those on to um, a local shelter that can use those and help folks who may be struggling this time of year. Um, do think about making a donation. Again, that's next Saturday the 12th from 12 o'clock till 3 o'clock at our Cadzo Parish Church Hall and look forward to seeing you there. Thanks.